Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Learning to Grow Native, Four Seasons of Transformation in a Residential Landscape with Emily Gustafson. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please only put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Emily. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on my colleague, Emily. As the MPF Grow Native Operations Assistant, Emily Gustafson provides administrative and outreach support to carry out the mission of MPF and its Grow Native program. She grew up in the Pacific Northwest and her love for conservation and the outdoors started with exploring her neighborhood's state natural area in Portland and spending summers on the rocky shores of Hood Canal in Washington State. Emily lives in Columbia, Missouri, and currently serves on the City of Columbia's Climate and Environment Commission and is a Missouri Master Gardener. For the past four years, she has worked to transition her city yard from traditional landscaping and invasive plants to a space with hundreds of Missouri natives and all the wildlife those plants support. We are excited for Emily to take us on her journey to growing native. And now I'll hand it over to Emily. All right, thank you so much, Haley, uh, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be with you all this afternoon and to be sharing my yard. Um, it's something that's really special to me and I am absolutely thrilled um, to be able to talk with you about it today. So as Haley said, I live in Columbia, Missouri. I live on a approximately half acre lot in town and started when we purchased our house five years ago um, and had a little bit of a, you know, a delay in moving into it. Um, but four years ago, we actually started to think more about our home landscape. So that's me and my partner, Victor. And you will hear more about Victor and see some pictures. Um, of, of him helping out with invasives removal, et cetera. Um, but I do want to give just a couple of caveats before I start my presentation. And that is first that I am a native plant enthusiast. I am not a biologist, I'm not a botanist, an etymologist, um, and I'm also not a landscape designer. And so all of what you're gonna see today is DIY. <laughs> This is what sort of an amateur native plant enthusiast um, did in her yard. And I hope that it's something that you all find interesting and inspirational. So why do we grow native plants? I mean, one of the obvious reasons is that they're beautiful and that they're interesting. Many of the native plants that we use in horticultural settings have really spectacular flowers um, and bloom throughout the season. Um, so you may have plants that are blooming in March all the way into December with something like an aromatic aster. These are, you know, these are really pretty flowers. And sometimes we have native plants that are so beautiful um, that they are not just grown as Missouri natives, but that they are grown as exotic ornamentals abroad. Um, so this is an example of pale purple coneflower at a retail nursery in Stockholm, Sweden. Pale purple coneflower is an icon of Missouri's remnant prairies. It's also on the MPF logo, um, but I think it's it's something to keep in mind that other people, <laughs> besides native plant enthusiasts in Missouri and the Lower Midwest, also find our Missouri native plants beautiful. But of course, we don't just grow native um, because native plants are beautiful in landscape settings. We also grow native for our community. So the other organisms that live alongside us, and that includes plants, of course, um, insects, uh, birds, amphibians, reptiles, <laughs> um, and even predators like a fox. Um, and foxes will depend on that web of life that is anchored by plants, 
and insects. So why did we choose then to grow native? We were new homeowners. Um, we had this half acre property. It was exciting to be a new homeowner. You finally get to make a space your own, but we kind of slid in to growing native. It wasn't something that we decided initially when we moved into our house. We didn't buy our house with the intent to redesign our yard. And we initially didn't take the chance to do that. And I think that it's important to recognize that some people don't begin growing native. And I think this is the case certainly for me because they see a list of the benefits of growing native. That's only one part of the equation. Something or some set of things have to motivate them, me, <laughs> to action. And I think that we all get there kind of in our own ways. And that's why I'm sharing my story of learning to grow native today, because it's a journey. It isn't just a one time, I think this is a great thing to do. I've decided to do it. Um, especially when you're DIYing it, it is a process. Now I'm gonna say we weren't totally ignorant of native plants when we started out. The little blue stem that is on this slide, I think is actually the very first native plant that we purchased and we planted it at our previous rental before we actually um, moved into our new house. So we knew some things, but we didn't know much. So there were actually five main catalysts that we had um, to growing native. And so one was um, getting just a taste of what native plants can do. And very early on, we planted four small plugs of butterfly milkweed in our new yard. And it was visited by butterflies. You can see there's a monarch chrysalis that appeared uh, that first autumn. Um, on our house. And so we got this taste for, oh, wow, we can see different things. We can bring insects into our landscape that we couldn't before. And it brought joy. We also had the experience of going to both planned native landscapes, like Bonnie View Nature Sanctuary in Columbia, um, as well as um, natural areas, so a remnant prairie, like Tucker Prairie in Callaway County. And it was there that I actually fell in love with the plant that you see in both of these images, which is Rattlesnake Master. But when I first visited Tucker Prairie and when I very, the first time I ID'd this plant um, at Bonnie View, I didn't realize that this was a plant that I could actually grow in my home landscape. And we also had the benefit of good neighbors. So seeing other folks who lived close by um, who were growing native plants. And that's the kind of thing that kind of creeps up on you. You go for walks and you see the asters blooming. You see milkweed blooming. Um, West Ash Neighborhood Association here in Columbia puts on a pollinator day once a year. And before we had transitioned any of our yard really to native, besides planting those butterfly milkweed, we went to pollinator day and it was really cool. It was a really fun experience. And it's like, oh, I see other people doing this. Maybe this is something that I would be interested in doing too. We also had this interesting uh, experience with our uh, landscape. So when we uh, started out um, in our house. We had a large lawn in front and in back. We hired somebody out to do the mowing, you know, riding one of those big mowing lawn mowers around the yard, doing all of the edges with a string trimmer. Um, we ended up actually transitioning away from using um, that lawn service because of that insect you see on the inset there. So I really like walking stick insects. Um, and we found some on the oak tree that is in our front yard. And what walking sticks do is they, the females, they lay their eggs in the autumn, then they overwinter as eggs in the leaf litter, typically under oak trees. And I started to get really anxious about our uh, lawn guy weed eating under our burr oak tree. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're killing the walking sticks. <laughs> and so 
we ended up purchasing our own ele our, an electric lawn mower, no longer using the mowing service. And so that actually was really empowering that we weren't just sort of doing the thing that is done in our neighborhood in Columbia, which is hiring lawn people with big riding mowers to come and take care of the lawn. Um, but we ended up you know, actually starting to do it ourselves. And once you start doing something yourself, you start to notice things that you didn't notice before. And then finally, this was 2019-ish and plant apps were getting really good. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't think we would have made the transition to growing native when we did or how we did without plant ID apps. Um, and so these are actually photos uh, from that initial season that we used uh, with iNaturalist to identify um, some of the natives that were actually already growing on our property. And so we were able to ID some of those natives, but also learn to ID invasives. And so you can see in those photos, winter creeper on the ground. We didn't know what winter creeper was when we started off, um, but we were able to ID it with uh, this new technology that we had on our phones and actually learn, okay, hey, maybe this is something we don't want in our landscape. We also had some other things that were working in our favor, not just these kind of idiosyncratic uh, experiences and the types of things you know, that we were interested in doing, like going you know, out to Tucker Prairie or taking walks in our neighborhood. Um, we actually had a good base in our yard of native plants, but really in kind of two modes, um, the mature canopy layer, and then those spring ephemerals. So we had something that could be preserved. And I think that was a really great place to be able to start. Um, we also don't have a homeowners association. We live in a neighborhood that's a little bit older, closer to central Columbia, and we could do whatever we want with our yard. There was nobody to tell us what we needed to do. Um, we also started getting interested in native plants just in time for the city of Columbia's native landscaping ordinance to be enforced. And so that was passed in 2019. And so that ordinance actually allowed folks to grow native landscaping um, and for that not to be captured by the weed ordinance or the nuisance ordinance. We also have a few limitations on our yard use. So we don't have dogs, for example. So we didn't have to kind of think about how do we contain for you know dogs in this space? What do we, you know, if this is gonna be a high traffic area, like what do we do with it? We didn't have those types of things to contend with. We also, <laughs> um, you know, our interest in native plants coincided with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we had time through the lockdowns and working from home. And we also just kind of had no interest in or commitment to conventional gardening or landscaping. Some of that is just a result of, you know, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. Um, these are the types of landscapes you see in the slide that I grew up with. Um, very different from the types of landscapes that we have in Missouri. So I didn't come in with an attachment to you know, a particular kind of, you know, lawns are great. We want very conventional landscaping. You know, it's not something that I grew up with. It's not something that I was around. It's not something that I lived with like during my twenties either when I lived outside of the West. Um, lawns are water hogs. <laughs> they don't do well with dry West Coast summers. I had no suburban dream to kind of recreate in my own yard. So that also, you know, that was an advantage, right? There wasn't anything to kind of you know, culturally sort of move back from uh, for, for me with transitioning native landscape. So I was ready <laughs> for conversion. Um, and at the root of, you know, the kind of mental steps of making the conversion from um, conventional landscaping to native landscaping is really changing the way you think of, um, you think about, what landscaping is, what it does. Um, rules or norms in some cases have led us to monoculture and just blah, landscapes that aren't interesting. They're not interesting for us. They're not interesting for animals, insects, pollinators, et cetera. Um, 
And so, you know, how do we consider the outcome of our actions in our yards or inaction, right? Just letting things go, that has consequences too. And so when we think about the consequences of our landscaping choices, you know, that's going to be costs, monetary costs, labor, your own or someone else's, biodiversity and wildlife, water quality and stream health, carbon output, and then those kind of social and cultural consequences that, you know, people may praise you or they may question what you're doing. So little by little, we transitioned our landscape from a conventional one to native landscaping. And I'm going to share um, some photos in just a few moments, but I also wanted to say a brief note about patience, because patience is really important. And it's something you hear from people who are on the other side of a native landscaping transition. Um, we don't kind of, you know, as gardeners, we have whatever kind of gardening you do, you can wrestle with time, you wrestle with seasons, with growth, with decay. Um, and transitioning to native landscaping is no exception. And, you know, there are components to this sort of, you know, a boxwood is a boxwood, it stays a boxwood, it's what it looks like season after season. Um, but, you know, with native landscaping, for example, you don't always, actually, typically, you don't get instant results. Um, perennials, grasses, shrubs, they take time to grow, to mature, years. Um, and if you're like us and you also have invasives to deal with, that's a multi-year process too. And I don't know that we quite understood when we started off that we would need the patience <laughs> that, that was eventually required. Um, but hindsight is, is always 2020 with these sorts of things. So this is what our house looks like when it was on the market before we bought it. Um, this has four boxwoods in front, I think some creeping phlox, some dwarf rhododendrons, a wigalia, and some daylilies. And in front of that, there's a fir oak tree that you'll see in a few minutes. And then there was also this very scraggly looking little apple tree. This is what our yard looked like uh, in summer 2021. So this was after about a year and a half of starting to add natives to our yard. This is summer 2022. So you can see the landscaping starting to mature. You can see some of the same plants, like those blazing stars. They're getting bigger. They are filling in. The grasses are getting bigger. And then this is summer of 2023, and this is a mature uh, native landscape. And so there are still some places where plants can fill in, but this is this is where these plants are the size more or less that they're going to be. Um, we may add additional density, but you can see the difference between that <laughs> that first picture and and the third picture. This is another view of the front bed of our house. This is summer 2019. This is when we had planted that little blue stem and those milkweed uh, plugs, and that's it. Um, this is when we first moved back into the house. This is close to the same view. I can't actually take a photo at quite the same view because of the uh, coral honeysuckle trellis in summer of 2023. So this is four years later, um, again, a maturing native landscape. And then we had our backyard, which was a whole different problem, <laughs> which was not conventional landscaping. It was invasive plants. Um, and so you will see a landscape dominated by winter creeper, burning bush, bush honeysuckle, and privet mostly. And you can see how a, what that infestation of winter creeper in particular looks like. This is spring 2020 when we had started to remove um, those invasives. And so we're seeing the um, we're seeing the winter creeper on the trees has died because we have cut the uh, stumps. Um, you can see that big brush pile of uh, mostly bush honeysuckle there. And then summer of 2023. And so this is a landscape that has had most of uh, the uh, invasives removed, um, certainly the shrubs and the uh, vertical winter creeper. We're still dealing with 
winter creeper like on the ground. And I'll maybe mention that briefly later. Okay, so this is the fun part, right? You saw where we started. You saw where we've ended this summer in 2023. Um, so what did we add? Well, we added hundreds of plants to the landscape. We got gifts from friends and neighbors, um, like the orange cone flower um, on one side of your screen. Um, we rescued native plants. Um, so I had a friend, for example, um, who was having her house built onto and asked for folks to come dig up her native garden. And so those are just boxes full of natives. Um, got a lot of plants <laughs> uh, that way. You'll find that you know when you're starting to grow native, folks are very generous with seedlings, um, with divisions, et cetera. Um, and that's the one way that we got native plants basically for free, which is important when you're adding hundreds of plants to a landscape. We also uh, winter sowed um, native seed. And that is, you know, a process that is, I will say, being perfected. Uh, but you, that's another way that we were at, able to add plants. We also purchased containerized plants. Um, and you will see the grow native tag on uh, those plants that I think are from the Missouri Wildflowers Nursery in Brazito. And those grow native tags were really important um, for me in learning about native plants and using those grow native resources. I call myself a grow native success story because the grow native resources were so important to me learning about native gardens. We also planted seedlings from the NBC. Um, NBC seedling orders open every fall. So we were like, we have to you know, replace the understory with something in this wooded area in particular that we have. And so we have done three years of uh, NBC seedling orders and they are in progress in filling in some of that, some of that woodland. We also um, direct sow some seeds, in particular annuals like Plains coreopsis. All right, so what we removed, <laughs> I noted that we had a lot of bush honeysuckle, burning bush, invasive privets, vertical winter creeper. We removed all of that. Um, we also removed most of the exotic ornamentals. Uh, there are a few that we have left. But in particular, we had a lot of really aggressive orange daylilies dug up by hand. Um, we also moved, removed about 60% of our front lawn. And we did all of this removal by hand. It was elbow grease. And we are committed to an organic landscape. And so we didn't use herbicides or pesticides. We also don't use chemical fertilizers. Um, but I can talk more if folks have questions about how we did honeysuckle burning bush, privet removal, et cetera. Um, but that is, you know, we, we did not treat the stumps, which added to sort of maintenance over time. We were able to kill the plants, but it's just a different process. Um, when we removed the lawn, we actually did sheet mulching. And so in order to not disturb the soil further, um, we laid down either uh, cardboard um, or uh, paper bags and put compost and leaves over uh, the, the sheets. Um, in some cases, not in every case we did it, but in some cases we use landscape staples to keep the cardboard or paper bags um, actually like on the ground and not blowing everywhere in the wind. We actually found this is a really effective way um, without, you know, layer, having layers upon layers um, of actually removing like our lawn for extending our plantains. Uh, Bermuda grass is always difficult, um, and but this killed everything pretty effectively. Um, you know, sort of set back the Bermuda grass enough that we're able to uh, hand pull that where it pops up. Oops. Um, we also had the opportunity to preserve a lot in our landscape. And so we had these wonderful existing native canopy trees, a bur oak, hackberries, hickory, walnut, elm, red oak, cherry, chinkapin oak, 
And so we were very lucky that we had this really amazing um, woodland in a good portion of our property that was all native. Um, we also had some really awesome native understory and small trees. Um, so sassafras, rough dogwood, Ohio buckeye, redwood, redbud of varying sizes. So that was great to be able to preserve those as well. We had spring ephemerals, as I noted before. Um, we also had summer blooming natives like Virginia knotweed and jewelweed, sedges and violets. And we kept the two boxwoods that are on either side of our chimney in the front um, to hide utilities and to provide winter shelter. Um, this is an example of a patch of May apples that had been shaded by the bush honeysuckle, um, but continues to expand um, in the back woodland area. It's very cool um, to have those and to have um, zigzag spider wart, green dragon, trilliums, cut leaf tooth wart, um, all really wonderful to have that, have those natives back there that were hiding under, under the invasives. We also found an additional use for the uh, boxwoods in the front as trellises. And so that's trumpet vine on one side and honey vine milkweed um, on the other. So that was great to be able to repurpose those. Um, all right, so that's what we added, what we took away and what we preserved. Um, but this is the meat of it, right? What do you, what, how do we maintain a native landscape? So what are our practices for growing native? It's not just putting in plants, taking away plants. <laughs> um, it's maintaining that landscape over the course of the year. Um, so over the course of the calendar year, I mean, in addition to that, the landscape changes as the years progress. It also changes as, as we go around, as we go around the sun. So you may have heard this before, fallen leaves <laughs> are important to leave as part of our native landscaping practices. And this is something that we have, we started off doing it a bit and now we leave the leaves entirely, including sometimes our neighbor's leaves um, that are uh, in, that end up in our front yard. We have neighbors who have wonderful, beautiful oak trees and half of their leaves end up in our front yard. We try to make sure the drifts don't end up too deep, uh, but that we do not typically remove those leaves or we don't move them very far if we do need to remove them. Leaving the leaves preserves habitat. Who does it preserve habitat for? Critters like the spice bush swallowtail. Um, so that spice bush swallowtail um, overwinters as a pupa in the leaf litter and then becomes this absolutely beautiful spice bush swallowtail butterfly that nectars on plants like butterfly, milkweed, lays eggs on the spice bush, and the cycle starts again. Leaving the leaves can also be, <laughs> uh, you know, so this is a really dramatic image. You can see our neighbor's property where they do not leave the leaves and our property where we do leave the leaves. And I think that this helps to demonstrate, you can see where their water has flown um, or water flowed, <laughs> where water uh, flowed through our neighbor's yard. Um, and you don't see, even though we're on a similar slope, um, the same type of erosion in our yard as in our neighbors. And so having those leaves helps hold that soil during the winter as well. Leaving the leaves also can use them as mulch for beds. Um, have traditional mulch on the one side. That's what our house looks like again when we moved in. And then we have leaf mulch and we just leave whole leaves um, on the other side. And you'll often see throughout the winter birds investigating the leaves, kicking through the leaves. And those insects that are overwintering in the leaves, those are food for birds as well. And I wanna make a note about oak leaves. We have a lot of oak leaves in our yard. We have several big oaks in the backyard and that those leaves are great in that woodland setting. We also have a bur oak in our front yard and our neighbor's oaks. And 
they're not great to use as mulch on prairie plants, um, but we do mostly leave them in kind of the prairie planting bed that we have. Um, they do suppress weeds. Um, we sort of make sure that they're removed away from kind of the crowns of the plants before they start uh, growing again um, and watch for kind of drifts being very thick. Um, but we do leave the oak leaves and they do take a very long time to decay, but they do eventually. Um, and those bur oak leaves, they're big. Uh, they are, you know, they, 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 they smother a lot of uh, a lot of lawn invaders, a lot of non-native lawn invaders, which I'm happy for them to, to fulfill that purpose. All right, I also wanna talk about spent vegetation. So we leave the leaves, we also leave spent vegetation. And this is another one where critters will thank you for leaving your vegetation standing throughout the winter and not cleaning up your garden in the fall. And this is particularly true for those sort of front yard landscapes. You know, in the back, we just let the seasons cycle through as they're going to with leaves and vegetation. Um, but you know, for that, if for that bed that's right on the street, it is dramatic to to leave the to leave the spent vegetation standing. So when well, we're talking about leaving that spent vegetation, I mean, the first thing is seed heads, I think, are really beautiful, right? We focus on the beauty of flowers and plumes, but that Joe Pye seed head, the wild bergamot seed heads, they're really pretty. And I'm happy, of course, in most cases, to let my natives reseed, um, but they have the, really their own beauty too. So, you know, this is a big thing about altering our mindset about what is beautiful. It's not just the plant in bloom, it's also the plant after it has bloomed. So this is a view of um, our yard, I think this is in October. And so this is at the beginning of autumn. And I think this is really beautiful too. I think seeing the um, yellow leaves on like the, um, on the butterfly milkweed, for example, seeing the landscape change into the autumn colors and having the perennial and grasses be part of that is really fantastic. And this is a month later in November with snow. You can see that a lot of the color has left the landscape. And so now we have a lot of browns and there's still some, a few greens. That stiff goldenrod was, was green for a long time. Um, but I think this is really beautiful too. And this is, this is winter in the, in the front prairie planting. And I think something that might be surprising is when you see it in the snow, you actually see how little spent vegetation there is. Um, so once those leaves have fallen off and once you kind of the, like, you know, the density of the plant has decreased as it's desiccated and as uh, all of the like stems and leaves have dried out, you're actually not left with a huge amount of material. So I don't think this even looks particularly messy. Again, I think it's beautiful in its own way. And then of course, native plants have their own winter interests too. Um, this is purple coneflower that has been mostly picked clean of seeds um, by the gold finches. But again, the shadows on the snow, I think stunning. And this is uh, switchgrass um, in winter light that in most cases remains mostly standing um, throughout the winter. And that color, especially the golden sunlight on it, is absolutely beautiful. And you can also use those like dried spent stems yourself. Um, you can make dried flower bouquets of native plants. Um, or, you know, this is a picture of, of one of our Christmas trees a few years back where we actually used little blue stem from the previous year um, to kind of fill the role of when folks put um, like baby's breath or something like that um, in trees, in Christmas trees. And so it's just another thing that you can add as decoration for the time you're spending inside in the winter and not pottering around out in your garden. 
And then the other piece, of course, of leaving the stems is when to cut those back. Columbia's native landscaping ordinance actually requires these stems be cut back uh, by March 21st. It's a little bit early. I try to play by the rules because my garden is very visible, um, but I do leave uh, the stems that I have cut um, in places around uh, the garden and cut those cut those stems back to eight to 24 inches. And they really do just completely disappear once those plants grow up and fill in. All right, I also want to say a few words about uh, brush piles, <laughs> sticks, debris, et cetera. So things that are bigger than those spent stems like from your native perennials or from your grasses, um, but you know, branches, logs in some cases, um, the limbs that have maybe <laughs> fallen uh, out of a tree in a windstorm. And what we have done is do two main things with those, uh, with that type of debris. I hate to call it no waste. Um, one is actually putting some of those pieces in beds um, to decay, to act as nurse logs, um, to you give something uh, for the, the other kingdom, fungi, to, to break down um, and to also have, act as shelter for insects, for snakes, uh, for lizards. For the first time this year, we've actually had skinks in our yard. Um, and so those can act as shelter for those critters as well. But then we also maintain no fewer than four brush piles in the back of our property. And some of this just comes from, you know, kind of continuous invasives removal, but I think that brush piles are really beautiful too. And once you see birds foraging in the winter around brush piles, using them for shelter, cardinals, chickadees, wrens, white-throated sparrows, um, they really, they become beautiful in their own way. And we have enough space, we have a lot that is much deeper than it is wide, and so, you know, we're able to do kind of on the back part of our property things that, you know, we probably wouldn't put right in the middle of our front yard, um, but are really important contributors to kind of the fall, winter, spring landscape. All right, I also want to talk about mowing and mulching, or not, as the case may be with native landscaping. So we had a lawn in our backyard. But it turns out it wasn't really a lawn, even though there are some turf grasses. It was actually mostly sedges. And you can see those sedges greening up here um, earlier this spring. Uh, we have stopped mowing that back area, even though it was traditionally mowed. And we let the sedges reseed and expand and remove, if we spot some of those turf grasses, uh, pull those up or cut the seed heads off to try to keep them from expanding. And so it's not no maintenance, but it's no mo. And mostly the sedge is actually James's sedge with some Eastern woodland sedge in there as well. But most of the green that you see in that photo is James's sedge. We have also in the front yard, um, there wasn't really a lawn under the bur oak. Bird oak has a really dense canopy. There were not real turf, turf grasses weren't growing under there. Violets were growing under there with some smattering of turf grasses and other you know, non-native weeds. And so we just stopped mowing <laughs> under the oak. And of course we let the leaves, um, we let the leaves like, stay under the oak tree. And that effectively killed a lot of those non-native species native species like the violets um, remained. And so basically under the whole um, drip line of the Baroque tree, we do not mow. And so do we, what are we left with mowing? This. And so this is the backside of the front prairie planting in our yard and the sort of corner you can see of our front bed. Uh, that takes about 10 minutes to mow. And that's what we have left of lawn. And it goes really quickly with the electric lawnmower. 
And when it comes to mulching, as I mentioned, we use leaves as mulch. We also use green mulch and we use common blue violets um, as well as um, wild strawberry and rose verbena. The violets and the strawberry can be pretty aggressive. And so you do have to kind of keep an eye on them, maybe sometimes pull them black, back from the crowns of other plants. Um, but these really take the place of needing anything more than um, the leaf mulch, which you know often disappears by spring. And then these start to grow up and then we have green mulch through the spring, summer and into the fall. Another thing though that we have to contend with is unplanned native plants <laughs> or burrs, bullies, and better locations. I love all native plants for the wildlife benefits that they have. But there is some that, especially when you have a yard with a lot of woodland, that might pop up that are less ornamental. <laughs> um, so some of our native grapes, green briars, poke, stick seed, white avon, spurges, nimble will, and also you're going to get your know, trees, you're going to go a lot of tree seedlings. And, you know, this is a one of those, your mileage may vary. Um, I happen to really like, um, you know, most things that are native. Some of these I would prefer to have less of, especially those that, that have burrs. Um, but even if a plant doesn't have a place in your yard, and that's totally okay, um, it's still, you know, maybe fulfilling a function that you might want to consider um, when you are assessing the plant. And so on the one half of this slide, I have wild poinsettia. This is a really weird place in our yard. Um, we have a large driveway that um, slopes slightly downward toward the house and toward a sort of side slope. It gets a lot of water when it rains really heavily. So in order, and you know, I think many of you in Missouri know that even you know in the past few weeks we've had some really really heavy rainstorms. Um, anything that will grow on that edge to help absorb that runoff, I am more than willing to let grow as long as it's native. And wild poinsettia is one of those plants. So I think it's really cool on its own. Um, we also have areas that are sort of difficult and inaccessible. There's a slope that goes off the side of our driveway to our neighbor's yard, and it's mostly like fill rock <laughs> and very little grows in it, except bush honeysuckle grew in it. But pokeweed really likes it. And so we are happy to leave the pokeweed there um, as long as we catch seedlings in other parts of the yard. Then we also have those native ornamentals that are cedars and spreaders. Um, many of these are probably familiar to those of you who are engaged in practice of native landscaping. Um, we grow them because they have beautiful blooms, but they attract pollinators or hummingbirds, as in the case of trumpet vine, but they can spread by rhizomes, runners, or seed aggressively. And this is something to keep in mind as you are tending your landscape, um, what you want where and edit what you need to. But I do wanna put a plug in for some of these more aggressive plants. So this is common evening primrose at night. Those are stilt bugs and a katydid hanging out on it. It blooms at night. Um, it also, Japanese beetles love it and we use it as a trap for Japanese beetles. Um, and then this is actually a photo taken on December 9th of New England Aster with a uh, bee visiting it. So these different plants, even if they might have this, again, when we talk about what consequences we want to deal with, they might be aggressive, but they may have these other benefits that you want to consider and whether you want them in your landscape or not, and then how you deal with them. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on invasives and non-native weeds. I do wanna put in a plug for the Missouri Invasive Plant Council, moinvasives.org, that has a tremendous number of resources about identifying native plants, um, about ways to control those native plants, 
Um, and that is something if you are not familiar with moinvasives.org and you are dealing with invasives on your property, that is definitely a resource that you should check out. But we also, so there are the invasives and then there is non-native weeds, typically lawn weeds, um, or what we sort of traditionally think of as lawn weeds. Bermuda grass and creeping charlie uh, or ground ivy are the ones that I deal with the most in my sunny plantings. They are annoying, but they can be dealt with. And so, you know, I'm always happy to hear the uh, techniques that folks use for dealing with um, these kinds of invaders. But when you're looking at your own landscape, um, I think that it is valuable to consider what role weeding will be playing in that landscape. Um, and especially if you have a lawn that has lawn weeds, many of those are gonna end up in your planting beds. So how are you gonna manage uh, those weeds, which can be time consuming, I'll say that. <laughs> When it's when the ground is moist, it makes it a lot easier to deal with this. All right, I also want to say a quick few words about uh, the context that we provide for our native landscapes, which is again, it's, this is a year round thing. Um, you probably notice in photos of my own landscape that there are signs. Um, we actually have a native garden sign, a leave the lead sign, a Missourians for Monarch sign, a support pollinator sign, as well as individual plant tags. And this for the purposes of education, but it's also to provide context because landscaping, when we think about what landscaping is, it's plants in context. And so that context is buildings, that context is roads, sidewalks, driveways, et cetera. But it's also a social context and a knowledge context really, and those signs help provide context to folks. And both of these uh, are great. So if folks are interested in, you know, what is this plant that's blooming? What, I really love this particular color. I love this shape. Um, these uh, grow native plant tags that are made in collaboration with wild ones, the order from St. Louis wild ones are, they've been wonderful additions to landscape. So many people stop and ask questions about them. Um, and then the grow native garden signs. That native plant garden sign went in when I had four switch grasses and a uh, and an aster in that front prairie planting bed. And it has been there ever since. <laughs> it got a different pull, um, but that has stood for four years um, as context for what I've been doing with my landscape. Then the final thing, this is a, this is like a mental reminder, right? This is a thing about gardening that we want, we want it to benefit us psychologically too. And that's something that you can do all year round, season after season, year after year. That's delighting in the habitat that you've created or restored. So go out and look at your garden at night put a headlamp on, see what is, see what's in the flowers, see what insects might be there, see if you have any other nighttime visitors. But look at how gorgeous those grasses are with the headlamp. They look totally different than they do during the day. Or appreciate plant companions. So this is early, it's fairly early in the spring. Um, this is red columbine and wild geranium. I love these colors together. And this is the first year that those wild geraniums bloomed like that. And I was so excited to see, it's not really a contrast, it's a complement with those two plants so close together. But you can also make your own plant companions too. For example, um, creating bouquets from your native garden. Basically, have as much fun as this juvenile northern flicker is having eating uh, dogwood berries. Um, this was just like last week and that flicker was very, very excited about those berries. So you do all that, all of that wonderful maintenance, you leave the leaves, you leave the stems, 
you change the way you mow, you change the way you mulch, but there's still ongoing challenges. Like Mr. Groundhog here uh, deciding what to snack on. <laughs> but again, you know, this is a community, right? Groundhog is part of that community. Um, so is that groundhog a problem or annoyance? It's mostly an annoyance. Um, but, you know, if it isn't one thing, maybe more invasive plants, right? And for us, especially that's winter creeper on the ground, it continues to be a real challenge. Weeds like Bermuda grass and ground ivy that I talked about, heavy deer pressure and drought. This slide is a little bit, that picture I'm kind of airing my dirty laundry, that's a part in my front bed that has been decimated by rabbits, deer, and the drought. And so what had been really lovely last year is now wild strawberry and violets and some partridge pea stems that have been stripped clean by, by our rabbits. Um, and you know, deer and drought can have a, those those mammalian herbivores and drought can have a really tremendous impact on establishing thriving native plantings. Um, again, you know, they are absolutely part of the community that we are hoping to support. Um, and drought is, of course, something that we can't help. Um, but it's you know, these are challenges that come about with with our native landscapes. And then finally, there are things that other people do that impact your yard. And so that might be construction, it might be a lack of invasive control or herbicide or pesticide use on nearby properties. And so, you know, here's elderberry, here's Maximilian sunflower. That elderberry has been chewed on by twin fawns that have been hanging out in our backyard. And that Maximilian sunflower is looking real leggy. <laughs> but when you move away from, you know, is the plant beautiful to is the plant fulfilling an ecological function that you want it to fulfill, then that contextualizes, you know, that herbivory or, you know, that sign of drought a little bit differently than if you're like, oh, it's just ugly. Um, and it's not ugly. It's still fulfilling an ecological function that is beautiful. And I'm just going to share very quickly a few of my favorite plants, um, just to share those and go through these slides real quick before we get to Q&A. This is Royal Catchfly. Absolutely love it. Um, native annuals are something that I would love to see more folks use in native landscapes. This is partridge pea and red whisker clammy weed. Uh, partridge pea is buzz pollinated by bumblebees, which is really wonderful to watch. Um, this is lead plant and wild senna. Both of these are in the pea family. They're legumes. Um, again, wonderful pollinator plants. The wild senna is a little bit like a giant partridge pea. It also has extra floral nectaries uh, for ants. So you can see ants going up the stem of that wild senna. These are two really different plants, but equally lovely in their own context. We have gray sedge, which is stellar in the low moist parts of our backyard. Um, it tolerates the, you know, the drought a little bit uh, in the summer. Um, and also is something, we didn't talk about the runoff that goes through our backyard, um, but can stand, uh, a little bit more moisture in kind of intervals, not, not flooding exactly, but sort of short intervals of intense moisture. Um, then we have, this is late figwort. Late figwort is one of my favorite plants. It does not have showy flowers, but it is beautiful because it attracts so many pollinators, wasps, bumblebees, and hummingbirds. And again, these are two very different plants. Maidenbush, which is a woody shrub, fairly small, blooms all summer. Tiny bees, flies, etc. love that plant. Um, and it does really well in dry locations. And then bladdernut is a great woodland understory plant. Um, and it has, when 
those when seed pots mature, they look like floats um, and they're really, really beautiful um, and a good kind of alternative to bush honeysuckle. So I hope that you have found some inspiration uh, in what you have heard from me today. Presentation went a little bit longer uh, than I had I had planned, but that is okay. I look forward uh, to answering questions from you. You can see there's a good view of our burr oak. She was planted about, she, it was planted about 25 years ago, given the female name Octavia uh, by the previous owners. But we continue to refer to, to that tree as Octavia. Um, but I hope that you've been inspired by seeing diversity of um, a, you know, a urban suburban native landscape um, that has evolved over the course of the past five years. So I am happy to take those questions uh, when Kaylee is ready. All right, thank you so much, Emily. Um, it looks like the chat lit up with all kinds of uh, praise for your presentation. So I think that you um, did a great job in providing a, a very thorough introduction to Growing Native. So let's go ahead and get to some questions. Um, some of these, um, some if if someone is on that put a question in the chat, if they could throw those in the Q and A section, um, that would be helpful. I um, just noticed a few of those, but the first question um, is from Paul, and he says that they have a large turf grass area that they want to reduce, and they're thinking of killing off the grass, tilling letting it lay fallow over winter and then have considered seeding it with a good prairie wildflower mix um, because they think that the plugs will take more time. So do you have any any thoughts on that? I know that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that you're not a, a, a landscape expert, except it kind of looks like that. <laughs> so do you have any thoughts on uh, this method that Paul mentioned? So in general, um, I think this is uh, something that most folks who are involved in native landscaping as amateurs and professionals would say is actually to discourage tilling um, because you are disturbing the soil and you're actually bringing up more weed seeds when you till um, because there will be <laughs> weed seeds. I, it, there will be more weed seeds than you anticipate. Um, and so something where you are actually not disturbing the soil um, is typically the best method. You can solarize, you can apply herbicides. Typically it takes a couple of treatments um, with herbicides to actually get, you know, our lawns are typically not one type of grass. It's typically not just fescue. It's typically, you know, some combination of cool season and warm season grasses, weeds, et cetera. Um, and so you may need to do a couple of rounds um, of herbicide application. Um, you can do sheet mulching. That's hard on a really large area. And so that's why when we've taken a lot of our lawn, but it's been in fairly you know, small chunks as we've expanded our beds, which is, an, which is an option for kind of how do you eat an elephant piece by piece. Um, but we actually have a really awesome resource on the uh, Grow Native website. Um, it's also on Mo Prairie um, that is about establishing a prairie planting from seed. And it talks through in that resource. I mean, we can add this actually into the email that we send out after uh, the webinar. Um, it's a fantastic resource that talks through site prep as well as what, what do you do after you seed because there's maintenance after you seed. And I have not had experience with large areas of seeding in my own landscape, but there are the folks who put uh, those resources together have a lot of experience with that, with those seeded restoration or seeded prairie plantings. So we can make sure that that's in the email to you um, that everyone gets these minutes. Yes, great idea. And we'll make sure to include that. 
All right, the next question. Um, Mary wanted to know what species you planted from the state nursery. Um, were they mostly mid-story level trees? So actually mostly uh, shrubs, woody shrubs and small trees. Um, so the species that we got sort of piss, I don't know if I can do height order, but um, aromatic sumac. And we chose aromatic sumac because that is actually typical of the woodland community that our neighborhood is historically a part of. Um, and those, you know, don't get very tall. They were five feet kind of in shady areas. Um, nine bark, um, which is, I think, a real native shrub workhorse. If somebody has, if somebody asks me, what do I plant here? I don't want to like worry about it. <laughs> I say, get a nine bark. And the nine barks in the state nursery have been awesome. Um, spice bush, again, which is not a very large plant, but we put those spice, spice bush in the ground and on like that late summer, early fall, we had spice bush swallowtail caterpillars on them. Um, we also had a kind of bad experiment with smooth sumac. The deer just ate them and that was that, and we couldn't do anything to protect them. Uh, gray dogwood. Um, we had a handful of those, um, but we've just let kind of our rough leaf dogwood spread in the back, which now that it's free of all of those invasives, it's been able to do, which is fantastic. Um, a few black haws and a few button bush and a few pawpaws. And those have been, you know, the seedlings have been great. The deer have not been. <laughs> um, and so when you are, you know, if you get those seedlings from the state nursery, you know, you want to be really mindful of how you are protecting them. And if you can't, you know, understand that there's going to be some mortality there um, from the urban brain. All right. Thank you very much. Another question, uh, I'm going to con combine a couple because you have piqued people's interest with your mentioning of uh, not using chemical applications to remove bush honeysuckle. So could you tell us a little bit more about your um, you know, non-chemical method for removing uh, those woody plants such a invasive such as bush honeysuckle? Yeah, so bush honeysuckle, <laughs> as terrible as a wrap that it gets, and the wrap that it gets is an invasive, is actually, I think, one of the easiest to get rid of. Um, and that is because it is really shallow rooted and it is easy to pop up if you have small plants. So the first step of this was we, we cut off the big ones. And the reason, so, you know, we didn't want to use uh, herbicides, you know, in, in general, because we uh, were invested in an organic landscape, but a lot of the bush honeysuckle is actually very close to the stormwater runoff that goes through our backyard. And we didn't wanna take any chances with um, herbicides making it into, listen, we were responsible for making it into the watershed. So that is, you know, th that was our reasoning. And so we, we cut the big ones and we did a couple of different things with the large, uh, with the large honeysuckles. Some of them actually just died. And that was great. Um, you know, they just didn't, you know, it was uh, maybe because they were, you know, stressed otherwise, they just didn't make it. The two methods that we used for the others were solarizing them. So we put plastic uh, garbage bags <laughs> over, or buckets in some cases, over the honeysuckle stumps. Um, and that was actually pretty effective. We left them for uh, more than a year. So this was this was not an instant process, right? And that's the thing, if you you want, if I would absolutely support, if you have a lot of, if you have a lot of bush honeysuckle and you are comfortable with using herbicides in your home landscape, use those herbicides. Like that is, it saves a lot of labor. But if you're willing to do other stuff, you can solarize them. The method that actually turned out to work, not just for bush honeysuckle, um, but also for burning bush, um, was 
cutting them down and then just rubbing off the new growth. And it took about a year um, in those cases for those plants to totally die. Um, but we, I just sort of patrol through the yard with leather gloves on and just tear the new growth off of the <laughs> honeysuckle and burning bush stumps. And that actually was really effective. Um, but for bush honeysuckle, if it was an inch or less, <laughs> um, I just pulled it straight out of the ground. Um, and sometimes we got a, a heavy solid steel shovel. And if it was like, oh, it's almost coming up, I just stick the shovel under it and pop that sucker up like a homemade honeysuckle popper. Um, and then for like the small, like honeysuckle seedlings or burning bush seedlings or privet seedlings, um, you know, now that all the big stuff is gone, I just walk through the property and pull it by hand. So like those little, earlier this spring, <laughs> I pulled about 200 burning bush seedlings in one place. If you don't believe burning bush is a like very aggressive woodland invasive, <laughs> spend an afternoon pulling hundreds of burning bush seedlings. Um, and you know, when they're small or even when they're like a little bit bigger, especially if you go out when the ground, it's not wet, but moist, um, you can you just pull those up by hand really easily. Um, and again, if you can't do that yourself, you can hire somebody to do that, or that might be a case where using herbicides might be more effective for you. But yeah, mostly we use solarization, cut and rub, and just popping those plants out of the ground with minimal soil disturbance. Great, thank you so much. You're gonna get big muscles that way, huh? Yeah, yeah, and that's that I will tell you when you are wielding a solid steel shovel and like you're using this kind of mo like sideways motion, like at a plant to get it under kind of a root, like because honeysuckle have, has that like weird root crown and you know, it's a workout. It is absolutely <laughs> a workout. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, a few people have asked how you remove the uh, and handle those invasive plants that creep into your garden bed. Um, so specifically, Dinah was thinking the mugwort and Japanese stilt grass that that she battles with. She just wondered how you handle those outbreaks in your own garden beds. Yeah, so I have not dealt with mugwort or Japanese stilt grass. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, the two kind of invaders that I deal with most in the garden beds are Bermuda grass and ground ivy. Ground ivy is very easy. It's, it's very easy to pull by hand because it has a really shallow root. Um, Bermuda grass is the opposite of that. And I, I, I have this technique that I use now where I find it and I, I, dig, I take a really sharp trowel and try to get it under the Bermuda grass runner or the stolen and pull it up if the soil is, is moist. Um, that's been actually, like I've, I've hand pulled a lot of Bermuda grass and it has been fairly effective. But I think when, you know, again, I'm not familiar with those particular plants, um, but I think it's helpful when you're dealing with any type of weed to like learn how that weed grows, learn how it spreads, learn what its root system looks like, um, whether it is something that you can cut down, that's really easy and it dies and that's it. You don't have to worry about it. If it's something you actually have to remove, um, if you actually have to like remove the whole plant, including like the, the roots, um, there may be different techniques for that depending on, um, depending on what that root structure looks like. And that's something I would recommend you looking for online. Um, and, you know, also like gardening websites, particularly for those like common garden weeds. Um, I typically send everyone to, you know, whether it's like the Missouri Botanical Garden, Grow Native, MDC, Illinois Wildflowers, which is an amazing website. But if you're dealing with sort of common weeds, um, gardening websites often have the good advice on helping to get rid of those from garden beds. Great, thank you. 
All right, another question coming from Jennifer is, um, did you, do you recommend using packets of mixed wildflowers? Uh, do you feel like that's an effective or better than buying specific plants and planting them in specific places? So I'll tell you what I have done. And that is, as I mentioned, I did not do seeded planting. The seeding that we've done has been native annuals. And so that has been partridge pea, plains coreopsis, red whisper clammy weed, and lemon bee balm. Um, I have winter sowed seeds in flats. Um, and I have a picture of that in the presentation. So I have not myself done a seeded planting in my landscape. The picture that you see on the screen and the pictures that I showed you of the prairie planting that I have in my front yard, um, that was all done with containerized plants or plants that were grown from seed separately. Um, or in a few cases, like the rattlesnake master, apparently I love it. It loves me too. And it has like seeded all over the bed and I am happy for it to be happy in my prairie planting. Um, so in some cases, you know, seeds have popped up there, but when it comes to seeding with a mix, I would implore you to go to the Grow Native Resource Guide if you were in Missouri or the lower Midwest and search, and that's grownative.org slash resource guide and browsing seed vendors and purchasing seed mixes from native seed vendors. Do not go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy like the big bag of wildflower seed. Um, if you are wanting to seed in your, in your landscape, get those native seed mixes from native seed retailers. And those native seed mixes, they will tell you exactly what seeds are in that mix. There's no sort of question mark, am I seeding half natives and half non-natives? Um, they will be able to also, in some cases, do a custom mix for you. And they'll be able to answer your questions about the plants and about doing uh, a seeded landscape. So I would discourage using kind of random bags or packets of wildflower mixes and instead making sure that you're getting those native mixes from a native plant retailer. All right, thank you very much. Um, Pam had a question, uh, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but do you know if Virginia creeper will overtake Rose verbena? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that, um, but I will say from my uh, experience with both plants, is that Virginia creeper actually seems to play pretty nicely with other plants, and rose verbena does too. Rose verbena is not a very long-lived plant, so it's not one that you know it may it will reseed itself, but you know it, you may only get a couple of years out of sort of an individual rose verbena plant. Um, so I have the rose verbena in with wild strawberries. And it, they, they play fine together. Wild strawberries are actually fairly aggressive um, as these kind of green mulches go. Um, and rose verbena also blooms, leaves out and blooms earlier in the year than Virginia creeper leaves out. And so I, it's something that I think I would encourage you to try. Um, and I don't see a reason why those two plants that I think are not particularly aggressive um, would uh, probably probably play nicely together. And that would be actually be very beautiful to have that contrast of foliage with the larger um, leaves of the, the Virginia creeper and those small finer leaves and bright flowers of the rose Great, right. thank you. Another question uh, from Lori is, do you keep any ornamentals such as daffodils, et cetera? So I blew through it on, on the slide because we were, uh, we had a lot to get through, um, but we do have daffodils and I, have, I haven't dug the daffodils up. And we have daffodils in our front beds, a bunch of different species of daffodils. I could not tell you what type of daffodils they are. 
We also have daffodils that are in um, our back woodland area. They don't seem to be, they don't seem to have a negative effect on like the other plants that are back there. And so we haven't dug them up, we may eventually. Um, but I think, you know, bulbs are, you know, they are beautiful. And if those are something you want to be a part of your landscape, you know, we, the daffodils, they're cheery, right? You know, when you get those bright yellow daffodil blooms or, you know, orange and white or yellow and white, you know, after a long winter, it's really nice. Um, the other ornamentals that we kept, we have two peonies. Um, we kept them mostly because I think they're impossible to dig out because they have been, um, they're on the side of our driveway, that's on the north side of our driveway. They are under hackberry trees. I think that the hackberry roots are completely entwined with the, uh, <laughs> with the peonies. And so I think the peonies stay. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm happy to have them. Um, I think that that's a, you know, I, I would love to have a hundred percent native landscape, but I think mean, it's okay to have things that are just, you know, ornamental plants that, you know, may be interesting and beautiful themselves, as long as they are not invasive. All right. Thank you. Um, another Question coming in from Jamie is, would you share with us the plant ID app you mentioned that you um, prefer? So um, I typically use two um, and I've, I have learned a lot about plant identification in the, in the four years I've been doing this. I'm, I'm pretty good <laughs> at this point, um, but when I do use the apps, I use iNaturalist and Picture This. And those are the two apps that um, I use to like learn how to identify um, different types of plants, both exotics and, uh, and natives. Um, and I find that actually, if, you, if you're really unsure about something, uh, I think actually using multiple apps can be really helpful because it can kind of get you in a direction where even if you're unsure about the ID, you might have a genus, for example, or you might be like, oh, I, it's definitely not that thing. Let me see if I can like Google the characteristics of this plant. And there are some, I mentioned Illinois Wildflowers is a really awesome website. It's about, it's Illinois native plants, but many of those native plants also native to Missouri, um, and Missouri plants, I can't, it's dot, it's dot org, missouriplants.org or dot com. We will, we will make sure it is correct in the email that goes out. Um, but, you know, if you can kind of narrow it down to a genus, or if you have kind of a, if you have some way to describe the plant and you have more information than just like, it's a plant, I have no idea what it is. With a combination of those apps and the resources that you have online, you can typically, it can take you a bit, but you can typically get to an ID. Um, another really great resources for ID um, is the Missouri Native Plant Society Facebook group. And that is, if you have a question about a plant, people are very generous with ID plants. You can also search plant identification. Um, on the, uh, in that Facebook group, because in a lot of cases, you're not, probably not the first person to have seen that plant in Missouri, and somebody has asked that question before. Great, thank you for those resources. Um, I think we just have one more question that I think um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing you address. Um, didn't hear you mention this, but Shirley wanted to know, uh, how to eradicate poison ivy. Did you have that issue? We have, so we have poison ivy. We have a, we have a small amount of it. Um, it is a native plant. It is a native plant with wildlife benefit. I let it, it's in the back. I let it hang out where it is. Um, there are different techniques for eradicating poison ivy. Um, it does, I think, pull pretty easily. So if 
you, um, depending on that, there are some large, let me say, I don't know what the size of infestation is that, that you're talking about. Um, I saw it at a nonprofit that I, that I um, take classes at. Um, they have a poison ivy plant that's like growing up the back of one of their sheds. The thing is huge. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's an incredible plant. Um, and I'm like, hopefully nobody who is highly allergic to poison ivy gets near that. Um, but, you know, typically if you prepare, so know if you're reactive to poison ivy or not, you may not know. Um, if you know somebody who is not reactive to poison ivy, it is pretty easy uh, to deal with, pull it up. You could also cut it and um, treat the stem or the stumps with herbicide. Um, if you have just a few plants, um, that's a lot easier to deal with than a large number of plants. I will say my experience with poison ivy is not actually in my own yard, but I helped put in a native plant garden down the street from me, which was in an area that was heavily infested with poison ivy. And what we did was covered sort of head to toe, made sure that like we had nitrile gloves on and went to town on it and just don't touch anything after you have, after you touch the poison ivy shower when you get home. Um, but knowing kind of the level of infestation, your own reactivity to it, um, you know, if you really want to remove it, and if it's in a place where it's going to be problematic for you, um, you're just going to have to assess kind of what the, what the situation looks like for you personally. But if you can find somebody who's not reactive, great, golden. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Well, I think that uh, wraps up the question answer uh, period. So I wanted to mention uh, again that this webinar is being recorded and an email will be sent to you all tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources that were mentioned um, today. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we hope you'll join us for our next webinar on August 30th, a uh, Grow Native webinar called Soft Landings, providing year-round sanctuary for pollinators with Paula Diaz. And again, Emily, thank you so much for inviting us into your uh, home, so to speak, and to see your journey going, growing native. It truly really is inspirational, and I hope that you and everyone else has a great evening. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, it was great to spend this time with you, and I hope that for some of the questions that you know we didn't quite have the answers to, but we're pointing you to resources, that we'll get those to you in the email that uh, comes out um, probably tomorrow. So thank you so much and happy native gardening. Take care. <laughs>